The world's population is ever expanding. In 1999, the world's population hit 6 billion. In 2011, it reached 7 billion. And it's expected that the world's population will reach 8 billion by the end of 2022 or around the start of 2023. And yet at the same time, we're seeing the global total fertility rate start to decline, going from 4.86 in 1950 all the way down to 2.23 in 2021. To explain this trend, we can look at urbanization rates, economic opportunities, increased rates of education for women or cultural shift, all of which we've talked about on this channel already. For this video though, we are going to focus on women and their role in society and how that impacts a country's population. All around the world, women continue to get more access to quality education. This allows women to gain new skills that can help them in society and the workforce. It also allows individuals to learn more about how to keep children safe healthy, and of course, happy, all of which reduce a country's IMR. We can see that when women feel confident that their children will survive infancy and childhood and are given more roles in society, they start to have fewer kids. As women continue to become more educated, they spend more time in school and will then also spend more time in the workforce where they'll be able to take advantage of their new skills. As women participate more in the workforce, they often decide to have kids later in life, which reduces the average family size since there's now less time for women to have have children. We can see these trends around the world. For example, when looking at the total fertility rate of countries around the world and the gender inequality index, we can see that countries with less opportunities and protection for women often have higher amounts of inequalities and often have higher total fertility rates. We can see similar trends if we look at economic opportunities allowed for women in countries around the world. Countries with less economic opportunities tend to also have higher total fertility rates, while countries that have more economic opportunities for or women tend to have a lower TFR. When women focus on their careers, they often don't start having children until later in life. For example, just recently, the average age for giving birth in the United States hit 30 years old. Speaking of economics, we can also see that in core countries or more developed countries, the cost of raising a child is more. Children are more of an economic burden, while in periphery countries or developing countries, having larger families can actually be an economic asset. Since children can often help out around the home or the farm, changing gears to societal factors, we can see that societies that have improved healthcare that is accessible to all people see their infant mortality rates and maternal mortality rates decrease. The maternal mortality rate is the annual number of female deaths per 100,000 live births from any cause related to pregnancy. When these rates are lower, it shows that a society is better at providing healthcare services for women, which reduces the TFR of society. If society also educates people on family planning and provides resources such as contraception like birth control and condoms, it can lead to a decrease in the NIR as well. Speaking of education, remember when women are able to get educated, they spend more time in school and building towards a career. This not only changes when women start to have kids, but can also help change cultural attitudes and gender norms. When society moves away from traditional gender norms, such as women being seen as child bearers and caretakers, we start to see the TFR and NIR of a country decrease. If we look at the political aspect of society, we can see that governments that implement pro-natalist policies or anti-natalist policies can directly impact the NRI of a country. Governments that offer maternity leave and paternity leave for its citizens or help cover childcare costs will promote citizens to have more children and reduce economic barriers for families. Whereas governments that offer little help for families and do not provide leave for families with new children may see citizens decide to have less children due to different economic or social barriers. Now it's not just birth rates that are impacted by economic development and increased opportunities for women. Migration patterns can shift as well. We can see this when looking at Ravenstein's Laws of Migration, which looks at different demographic patterns Patterns and migration patterns. Now, before we go over Ravenstein's laws of migration, I do want to note that there is no particular order, and some of these have started to change in recent years due to different political, cultural, and economic shifts in society. Ravenstein's first law was that most migration happens for economic reasons and is done by young adults. This is because young adults do not have as many connections to a particular place and have more flexibility to take advantage of different opportunities. When individuals start to have a family and get older, it becomes more difficult to migrate, especially across international borders. The next law is that migrants often travel short distances and will travel in step migration. Migrants will often stop at different towns, cities, and settlements on their way to their final destination, which traditionally is larger urban areas due to the different opportunities.
facilities they offer. Which connects to the next law, which is migrants are more likely to move from a rural area to an urban area. And the farther the migrant is traveling, the more likely they are to move to a larger city. Speaking of settlements, we can also see that the direction of migration most often goes from agricultural based economies to more industrial areas or urban areas. This is because industrial areas and urban areas tend to have more economic and social opportunities for individuals. Now when looking at migration, Ravenstein also noticed that whenever migration happens, a counter stream is created. Which means when a person migrates to a new place, they connect their original location with the new location. For example, college graduates move from Florida to Minnesota to work at Mayo Clinic, where they talk about how nice Florida is, causing individuals from Minnesota to move to Florida. It's important to note that the migration stream that is created is not always equal. Oftentimes, there'll be more migration to one of the locations, but it's possible that the migration between the two areas could be similar in size. Next, Ravenstein noticed that large urban areas tend to grow more through migration than by their natural birth. This is due to urban areas having a lower TFR. This trend of people moving to larger urban areas is also seen in the gravity model, which states that people will be attracted to larger cities, even if they are farther away. Large urban areas have more pull factors that attract people to the area. They simply have more economic, political, and social opportunities for citizens compared to smaller settlements. When looking at the gravity model, you'll notice that the size of the settlements and the distance between them is factored into the migration pattern. Notice here that even though though City 2 and City 3 are closer together, both are more likely to migrate and interact with City 1. Which leads me to the next observation Ravenstein made, which was that migration increases economic development. Migration brings new goods, foods, ideas, businesses, and other productive assets with it. All of which leads to more economic output and growth. Lastly, Ravenstein noted that women are more likely to move internally within a country, while most international migrants are young males. This was because traditionally men were the ones who had access to more wealth and we're seen as the provider for the family. However, in recent years, we've started to see this change. As more women enter the workforce and gain financial freedom, we start to see more international migrants that are female. So there you have it, another topic review video down. Now, if you found value in this video, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And if you need more help with your studies, check out my ultimate review packet. It's a great resource that covers all the units of AP Human Geography, and it'll definitely help you get an A in your class and a five on that national exam. Don't forget once you're done answering the review questions on the screen to check your answers in the comment section down below or in the description of this video. As always, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much geographers for watching and I'll see you next time online.